everyone, this is Dr. Victoria Mattingly, and I'm thrilled to introduce you to Dr. Alexis Fink, who's going to be joining us for today's PSYOP Conversation Series live streamed podcast, where we talk with leading industrial organizational psychologists about important topics in the workplace. This is episode number 40, and we're going to be talking about science for a better workplace. Uh, today, Alexis will provide contemporary insights into the field of IO psychology. Welcome to the PSYOP Conversation Series podcast. Thank you. I am delighted to be here. I'm so glad to have you here. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Uh, Alexis Fink, PhD, is Vice President for People Analytics for Meta. Uh, and Sorry, for Meta. I want to make sure that comes across. I, I just love when IOs work at like really impressive companies. I think it shows the value we provide to the field. But I digress. We'll get into that in a we moment. We can go into so, that. Okay. <laughs> Vice President for People Analytics at Meta and the President-Elect for the Society of Industrial Organizational Psychology. She's been in the practice in IO psychology for over 30 years and previously held leadership roles at Microsoft and Intel. Alexis is a fellow of PSYOP and a frequent and engaging speaker on people analytics topics. She's authored multiple books and scores of articles and chapters, and she earned her PhD in IO psychology from Old Dominion University. University. Alexis, we're so glad that you could join us here today. This is going to be fun. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Now, where are you tuning in from so the audience knows? I am tuning in from Menlo Park, California at Meta's corporate headquarters. I'm here in part because we had our Connect event this week uh, showcasing the latest, uh, tr the latest features and products and uh, innovation in augmented reality, virtual reality, artificial intelligence. And I'm just like on a total product high right now. That is so exciting. I'm hoping we can get into that a little bit <laughs> before we get to your, what you're currently doing in your role. But let's take a few steps back. And um, I, I love hearing about IO psychologist's journey because it's never straightforward. I don't think anyone like wakes up one day as a kid like, I'm going to be an IO psychologist when I grow up. And so can you tell us about your journey as an IO psychologist? Like, How did you get involved in the field and what just spurred your interest in IO in general? Ah, oh, I love this question. Um, in the intro, you mentioned that I've been doing this for over 30 years, and that is not a lie. When I was a sophomore in my undergraduate, uh, we were living big city, and on the third floor of the apartment building we lived in was a woman who had a graduate degree in IO psychology. And my parents were very concerned that I was a psych major and thought I was going to be um, that I'd be a bartender my whole life and never afford a mortgage. And they were just not really into this. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. they um, introduced me to this woman in our building. And we had a January term, like a winter term that some schools have. And so I did an internship with her. And by like day three of this internship, I'm like, this is it. I'm in love. This is what I'm doing for the rest of my life. It's amazing. And sure enough, I you know went straight through. It turned out that my small school had an IO psychology professor. So I got to take a class in it yes. um, and uh, sort of went through. I found out after I finished my dissertation, it's weird that it took this long for anyone to notice it, that my grandfather had actually been doing sort of early IO psychology types of work, huh. in like the 30s and 40s, doing sort of like Taylorism kinds of things, which is kind of the way it worked back then. Um, but, uh, it, you know, it'd been a decade since he'd passed and I finished my doctorate. And my dad's like, well, you know, that's what grandpa did. Um, so unbeknownst to me, it was also kind of a family business. But I met it when I was 20 years old. I fell completely in love and it's uh, it's been a love affair ever since. OK, two quick follow up questions. What did you do in your internship that like sold you on the field? So there were actually two pieces of this internship, and most of my life now is pretty quantitative and pretty data-based, and this was not that. Um, the two pieces were like executive coaching and executive outplacement. So I started doing executive assessment work in um, literally my third day in this career, and I continued to do it for a long time. Uh, and then the really interesting stuff was all sort of under a header of organization development. So okay. strategy and business processes and how you would tie strategy and business process and org design together and, mm -hmm. and how none of these things operate in isolation. Uh, and if you want to move this thing over here, you have to move these other four things to enable it. And I was just, it's like the, the wool came off of my eyes and I was amazed. And it, it happened that um, my family was living overseas at the time. And it was a really interesting object lesson in what's true for humans broadly, and then what sort of interpretive layers and what's meaning making and how you would take 
in in our case, you know, uh, sort of canonical fact in IO psychology, and then look at in this particular case, like an Asian context, and what's true about leadership and styles and organization and power and authority. And how is that going to operate a little bit differently in an Asian context? Yeah. Um, or, and particularly in a multinational context that sits in Asia. And I was just yeah. like, this is the coolest set of problems. I can't even imagine ever getting to do anything more fun than that. Well, and that's where we're at in the diversity, equity, inclusion space right now, too, mm -hmm. with like, what does global DEI look like? And I like to think a lot about like, targeted universalism. So like, what's the targeted thing? What are the universal things that make sense for maybe how we measure, how we have like some processes and systems, but then what are the targeted approaches that are necessary to let that operate efficiently and effectively in that context? And then mm -hmm. exactly what that, like, what do you do? Like, I was talking to someone the other day about how their DEI function lives in Germany. And so they're trying Ooh. to figure, translate that leadership and that, you know, that DEI function into mm -hmm. the US. But anyway, the contextual stuff, I think, is so fascinating. And we need, as we are such a multicultural, multinational like, world, we need to figure that out. And IOs have a lot to offer to that space. So, okay, that was the first question. The second one <laughs> What did, like what was be what would be a type of project that your great was it your grandfather did in the thirties? It was 40s? Uh, yeah, it was like making fact. So remember, everybody learns about the Hawthorne studies and the lighting yeah. and whatever else. So it was working and making factories more yeah. efficient and effective and reducing injuries and all of those kinds of things. So really classic industrial side. IO psychology stuff, time and motion studies, things like this, so you can figure out the right staffing levels and, and whatnot. But it was uh, it was really interesting to realize that I, I kind of had that in my background. Yeah, it's so fast. You had IO in your blood. What a unique story. I love that. I love that. <laughs> um, and so I'd love to talk about your role as SIOS president-elect. It's very exciting, especially as a fellow uh, well, woman, but also like practitioner. Mm -hmm. I like to call myself a practitioner scientist because I really yeah. do. I've always, I was drawn to IO because I really like the scientist practitioner aspect of it. And I always say it doesn't matter if you go to work in academia or you go to work in an office building or you go to work in your in your house, you're still should have that scientist practitioner lens. So yeah, I'm just excited to have like a fellow practitioner scientist like uh, in, in the president role. And so like, what does it mean to you to be a leader as an IO psychologist? And what do you see yourself like doing whenever uh, you step into the reins in April? <laughs> so the nice thing about the leadership structure within PSYOP, particularly for the president role, is it is a three-year role with lots of guardrails. So yes. this, I'm a whole year as president-elect. It's not just a couple months between election and position, which means that Tara Barron and I are working pretty closely on a whole mm -hmm. bunch of stuff because it's her president year. And then Mo Wang is the past president, and he's kind of there to make sure we don't do anything dumb. Uh, he's sort of like the elder statesman. Yeah, in the yeah. um, and so you do have uh, a three-year time period to learn the ropes, be effective, uh, help make sure that we have durability and consistency and we're getting whipsawed around. I think for most people, PSYOP, at least for most folks who are IOs, PSYOP is really just the annual conference. And you don't realize um, all of the other pieces that go into it in yeah. terms of our publications, in terms of visibility, in terms of things like this, in terms of setting educational standards and um, providing leadership opportunities and the bench of volunteers, I think is somewhere around 800. It's There's just so so many volunteers, so many. Yeah. And, and so much fantastic work that they're doing. And it's supported by a small but dedicated professional staff. We have a brand new CEO. I'm really excited. Mm -hmm. I actually get to meet him tomorrow morning in what? person. I've only met him by video previously. Um, filling some gigantic shoes. We've been really lucky to have like decades of leadership from our, our prior CEOs mm -hmm. and executive directors. So stepping into huge shoes to make this whole thing run. But one of the things that's really interesting about PSYOP is as I've gotten older, I've realized there are like academic professional societies, like Academy of Management, it's only faculty. Yeah. And then there's sort of like professional associations, yeah. um, which are all practitioners. And it's not very often that the two get a chance to come together. It's true. It's true. And so um, I'm excited as uh, in a leadership role for PSYOP to get to play with some of those um, intersecting points. Mm -hmm. And this is 
I think the most exciting and important time we could possibly be biopsychologists. Um, if you have not been living under a rock, you're aware that over the last decade or so, data applied to people problems at work has suddenly gotten to be the sexy new thing, right? Yes. So mm -hmm. if you go back in history, um, at the turn of the last century, finance emerged as a decision science from the operational discipline of accounting, and that revolutionized business and profit and all kinds of other things, and you know, fraud and other stuff too, but you know, it's mostly good. Yeah. And then mid-century, sort of the Mad Men era, um, you had marketing, which is a decision science, a data science that emerged mm -hmm. from the operational discipline of sales. Mm -hmm. Great. And you can't imagine a company without that. No. And the inflection point that we are in right now is people analytics or uh, John Bruguer called it talent ship like a decade ago. And I think that name kicked off or, or stuck. I, I read that article in grad school. I remember that article. Yes. Kirk Krager was really into it. So we had a whole discussion on it. <laughs> Oh, I love that. Um, but the, the, the decision science of people, uh, which for most businesses is their single largest budget item, um, the decision science around that, using it as a, using it being human capital of an organization, using them, using people as a force multiplier, as a differentiated advantage, um, really engaging in this effectively, instead of just thinking of it in sort of like an 80s profile of a cost center, you want to just keep costs down. Yeah, that's first you know. <laughs> right. That's the transition we are in. And you know who knows how to do that? I am psychologists. We do. We do. Us. This is a <laughs> moment. And as a result of that, there is really interesting um, risks and threats mm -hmm. where we're seeing, um, in some cases, uh, newcomers into the field who don't have grounding in things like ethics and law yeah. and how predicting employee behavior is or employee performance is necessarily different than like predicting a customer's performance or predicting mm -hmm. the performance of a server stack. There's some additional considerations. Um, and also uh, all of this interest has generated a flurry of regulation yeah. in a way that um, IO psychologists should be on a stronger footing mm -hmm. uh, in terms of influencing, just like we were Think about the 70s with the Uniform Guidelines for Selection Procedures, yeah. mm -hmm. like how we should have a leading voice in these spaces. And so thinking through how we do that uh, in the U.S. context, as well as um, working, uh, SIOP has a relationship with the U.N., yes. looking at like, mm -hmm. high quality work and fairness and safety and, and dignity. And it's just fun to get to sit in this moment um, in this profession and be able to help nudge this ship of, again, 10,000 professionals-ish who are members, 800 who dedicate their time and energy and passion towards this field and, and help us um, help us really be that rising tide that lifts all boats. Uh, you and I were talking right before we went online about how one of the things that's attracted both of us to IO and kept us in for a long time is in many cases, there's kind of a zero sum game for me to win, you have to lose. Like for me to gain market share, someone else has to lose it, right? Whereas in IO psychology, if it is executed well, and I've dedicated my life to making it executed well, both employees will benefit and organizations. Right? They'll be more effective, they'll be more efficient, they'll have fewer energies, they'll have lower costs, or fewer accidents, and they'll have lower costs. And um, employees will have better working conditions, um, safer workplaces, they'll have more predictable hours, like all of these kinds and of all that mutual leads good. To saving money. Right. All to saving money. And people have such a hard time seeing that, especially in a more niche area that I'm in with diversity and inclusion. Like, like you would never question, as you said, the value of a marketing team or right. the sales team or the finance team. So why would you question like the validity of the people team of those who are just trying to like keep people around, keep them happy, keep them you know motivated? But okay, so I, I would love to kind of pivot a little bit and right. especially um, those examples you just shared about the outcomes that we know organizational psychologists can have on the field and in within organizations specifically, like. What are some like wins that you've had over your career? And especially like, I'd love to hear more about your role as VP of people analytics at Meta and like your, you know, like what are some success stories there? And how has that experience been? Because it's honestly like, I've been following your career ever since I was a student and you've always been very inspirational oh to me. And like, you just have like the, the you, honestly, you have like the sexy IO job that I think <laughs> 
students and those early in their careers like, wow, like maybe I could work at Meta someday. So like, tell us what it's like. I'm just so curious. <laughs> um, so I, I agree. I do have a sexy job. I'm like every day I wake up like, I can't believe this is my life. Like this didn't exist 30 years ago when I started this. I'm just so lucky. Um, in terms of wins, um, a lot of my favorite stuff at whatever company I was at was under attorney client privilege. And so I ethically, I'm a big ethics person. I can't talk yeah. about it, but I, there are some examples I totally can. Yeah. And um, some of them are really concrete and some of them are um, more abstract. So let's start with a couple of concrete ones that are pretty old. Uh, and there's a big factory strike that's on right now. So let's talk about factory environments, which somehow seem less sexy, but are really important. Mm -hmm. Um, one of my favorite examples was a factory I was working at, and we had all kinds of conflict, as you typically do, between maintenance and production. They like, fought all the time, and maintenance, like their hours were terrible, and the call schedule was awful, and the costs were expensive, and blah, blah, blah. And at any rate, we did a bunch of diagnosis. This is an OD product, OD project, and basically did an organization redesign. We were embedding maintenance within the production and then elevating some of the production folks to be like junior maintenance folks. So you didn't always have to call in a maintenance technician. And sort of the end of that story has like two pieces that I love. One, all of your objective measures got better, right? There was less line downtime. There was less overtime for our um, for our maintenance technicians. There were like reduced costs and higher productive production, all of that terrific stuff. And the other one that I love is like my favorite metric. And I use this as every example I possibly can. It also happened to be the site that I was housed at. Um, and so I went to their Christmas party because I was invited. And uh, I'm like standing in the buffet getting my piece of fried chicken or whatever. And a woman comes up to me and she says, I don't know what you did, but my husband is not an asshole anymore. I was like, well, that's, you know, tell me more about mm -hmm. this. And it turned out that when we started this, three of the guys in the maintenance shop were in the middle of divorces and in the state of Virginia had to be separated for a year. And in like fixing the way their job functioned and getting them out of a world where everything was conflict and into problem solving and we you know taught them a bunch of like inquiry skills and whatever else all three of them had reconciled with their families mm -hmm. and it was just like this is amazing um the way you can architect jobs and work and workflows in a way that really impacts lives so that's a great example um I want to make sure that we don't lose time. So another example that I think I can talk about because it's um, it's far enough in the past. Uh, this would have been eight or nine years ago um, at Intel. We started building a uh, basically a skills infrastructure. Right. We use natural language processing. We did a bunch of extraction, um, and we figured out um, what you know sort of the whole architecture of ladders of skills and whatnot. Um, and uh, it's fairly common knowledge, Intel, um, like many industries, but Intel in particular, had a, a redeployment program where we'd cancel a project and you'd try to land people. And it was polite to say it was redeployment, but really, I think 70% of them ended up being laid off. And we were able to use this skills architecture and natural language processing to do extraction and some really sophisticated analysis to help people um, find a new role inside the company. Mm -hmm. And one of the problems is when you close down a project, like your whole network might go down with it. And so all of the other obvious fits will go away. Uh, but part of the skills architecture that we built made um, less obvious things available for matching. Mm -hmm. And the example that I use is I'm a social scientist. So like I would have talked about regression, but other fields would have talked about you know, machine learning. And it's the same math. Yeah. So my little engine could find could match me as a regression person on machine learning things, whereas a recruiter with a keyword search would not have discovered yeah. that candidate. Mm -hmm. And the end of that work is we had 80-ish percent of people instead of 30-ish percent of people mm -hmm. landing a new job. Wow. The couple of weeks that they had available. It was a transformative change. Wow. And it had stability. It was very beneficial for the company mm -hmm. because it was very expensive to lay people off. Mm -hmm. And it turned out that a lot of them ended up coming back to the company a couple years later. It just took a while to find the job. Okay. And so we were able to avoid like all of those expenses and all of that mm -hmm. disruption and all of that um, like tax on the psyche of the people who were left behind and all of, of course, the disruption to the person and their family yeah. uh, through effective use, effective and ethical use of data. Yeah. So 
I'm just so excited about the future of the kinds of work we can do, either using really old school approaches where you're doing OD and you're doing job design and you're doing it on like big pieces of paper with sticky notes and really advanced analytic techniques yeah. where we can um, we can do really great extraction. We can use NLP, NLP. It's interesting to start to see the Gen AI kinds of applications. Just um, the whole range is a lot of fun. I love it. You make people analytics like exciting and fun, which is it not, was exciting. It, that's not an easy task. I don't. <laughs> it's not an easy task. Okay, so can you tell us whatever you you're at liberty to share? Like, what's a typical day at work for you? Ah. So I am really fortunate in that I work for and with an organization that lives and breathes data. Um, and as such, I typically have, if I go back the several years I've been in this project, I'll typically have things that I'm working on as an individual contributor, sort of large scale horizontal projects uh, that might be about our data infrastructure, data governance. It might be about tooling. Uh, it might be about um, building out reports or data visualization. I also run an organization, so I'll have one-on-ones and career conversations and reorgs and moving people around mm -hmm. and budget conversation. The meeting right after that is for budget. It's like sexy. Um, and then I get to sit on our, I sit on the staff of our head of HR. Mm -hmm. So the last couple of days we've been doing 2024 strategy stuff. So working out what our our overall people at strategy is and making sure that that's really grounded in data. Mm -hmm. Very excited that it consistently is. Um, we'll do projects at the behest of um, uh, our board of directors, our senior executive staff, as well as individual programs. And those projects can range from uh, like generative research around how to approach a selection opportunity, the diversity space, performance management space, mm -hmm. Um, we'll work on uh, sort of classic survey and engagement sorts of things. Um, we do spend time on tooling. And so I'm really lucky that I get to dabble, I guess, in lots of different things, some of which are very bread and butter, some of which are just straight up organization leadership, mm -hmm. uh, and then some of which uh, let me get into um, uh, kind of the nerdy technical parts of um either reviewing an analysis or getting deep in an analytical plan mm -hmm. for how we're going to tackle, like return to office is a really hot topic right now. Yeah. So how are we going to, and obviously we've been working on that for quite a while. How do you um, build credible analytic frameworks um, to really uh, understand and support and move forward in whatever the pressing problem of the day might be? Oh my gosh. I How cool. And like, I know there's a lot of students that watch these episodes. And so quick pointer, while you're in your studies, especially if you are, if your program's affiliated with a business school, do yourself a favor and take like a business course or a management course, or even like a finance or an accounting course. Cause yes. I feel like we lack coming, at least I, for my, for myself, I lacked the business and financial acumen that even if I didn't own my own business, like just working internally, understanding the business, being able to talk about our our findings and our recommendations in terms of concepts executives care about and understand so we need to know that and so I regret not like taking a class or two in the business school because I think that would have served me so well as an IO psychologist so for those y'all watching out there see if you can take a business class even like a online whatever just like learn learn some stuff about business it will serve you very well <laughs> So I will yes and that, do the classic um, improv technique. I think that's totally true. And while I was in graduate school, I also looked around and said, we're studying HR, but we're not talking about compensation and benefits at all. This seems weird. And so I got myself a summer internship in a comp and vend department, and I learned how to do job analysis from a pay standpoint. And I started to understand how pay benchmarking works. And this is when the Americans Disabilities Act was new, really understand how to analyze a job from that perspective. And then not on purpose. I got reorganized under a COO and then eventually even reorganized into a supply chain team, which is a very weird side hustle or very weird, like a little side quest uh, for an IO psychologist. But like I learned how to do deep financial analysis. I learned how to think about um, uh, resilience in a supply chain and mitigating for disasters uh, that are things I use when I do succession planning work now. Yeah. Like, oh, how do I do an analysis to figure out what the 
the correct, the optimal succession depth is mm -hmm. and the the different scenarios I would need to do. I spent some time in that in that five year sort of quest through the desert um, doing real deep strategy work and understanding scenario planning and SWOT analysis and all these kinds of things. So you can take it in a class. You can also say, wow, I would like to eat better than ramen while I'm in graduate school. Let me get any job where they just need generically smart people. And let me do that. Yeah. Uh, and I've never, never had a job I didn't learn Look in data. See what kind of data. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. Like in, uh, yeah, I, yeah. And yes, and yes, yes. Okay. So no. th this episode today is about science for a better workplace. And I thought it was, it, I was reflecting before we jumped on and PSYOP slogan is science for a smarter workplace. And I do mm -hmm. love that, you know, because it gets at, you know, the, how we're bringing the science and, and the research to the field. But I think that only makes sense is if that smarter workplace is a better workplace as a result. Like, I don't care about a smarter workplace that doesn't ultimately serve the humans in that workplace. And so what does a better workplace mean to you? And how do you see the science of what we do fitting into that? Ah, so... Um... I have dedicated my life to work, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I, I don't necessarily think that a better workplace is one with less work in it. Yes. Right? Yes. Um, I agree. Because I, work should be right? good for work, and then life should be good for right. life, like, but get good work done at work, and then you feel better about life. <laughs> At least I do. And exactly. you, you know, discover that you can do hard things. Mm -hmm. And when, like, when my personal life has been really hard, work has been the thing that got me through. Me too. Right. And so it it provides architecture to your day, and it provides, <laughs> um, in the best cases, like really positive feedback and growth opportunities and esteem, and it can provide really wonderful things. And so a better workplace is one that provides those things. Um, there's a very painful area of study around abusive supervision. That's not a better workplace. Yeah. And um, there's some sort of folklore about how you have to, you know, break people down or put them in their place or whatever else. And that's just like not true. And so what are those things that we can do that we can prove scientifically mm -hmm. that um, giving people uh, you know, aspirational goals and the tools that they need to be successful is much better than yelling at them about what losers they are. Yeah. Uh, so I think that there's a lot we can do in terms of that, um, in terms of that framework yeah. for what good work looks like. Good work obviously needs to be safe. Mm -hmm. It needs to be appropriately compensated. And there's all kinds of problems with that yeah. at the moment. Um, it needs to uh, incorporate things that are important to your well-being and your family. So in the U.S., we have a system where your ability to have health care is tied to your opportunities for employment. That's it is what it is. So like, let's think about that. And it becomes really unethical to have employment practices that um, exclude people from that access. So we need to be thinking through um, what happens, what's inside the nature of the work, what's inside sort of the nature of the social systems around work and the nature of the kind of regulatory systems around work. Mm -hmm. um, I also think about work, I'm oh, sorry, my lights just went off um, and they went off again. Oh, this is super sexy right here in the now. Um, uh, I'm not moving enough apparently. Uh, we also need to have um, work where the requirements are clear and where they're fair and where it's accessible. Yeah. Uh, and some of that is on individual organizations and some of that's on us as a society. Mm -hmm. How do we think about um, accessibility for a variety of um, constraints or challenges people might face, yeah. which might include caregiving, it might include a physical limitation mm -hmm. uh, and making sure that work um, works there. Yeah. Uh, so I think there's lots and lots and lots of places that we as a community of industrial organizational psychology professionals can help make sure that work really is better. And again, none of those should make an organization worse. They should be making organizations better as well. Well, going back to what you said earlier, like, I feel like we're one of the few professions that us winning means others winning as well. You know, and I remember mm -hmm. like, one of my first like entrees into IO, I was talking to, I was sharing this story with you, I was talking to two IO psychologists and I was like, let me get this straight. So the executives hire you 
to then make the lives of the employees better, which then the organization benefits from. It's like, what is this field? Sign me up. Like everyone wins. Everyone wins. This is great. <laughs> um, and one of the, go ahead. No, go ahead. One of the things that I love about IO psychology specifically um, is the fact that we do really come from a scientific orientation. Yes. So rather than I trying to prove, you know, what we already believe, we really are looking at discovering what is true. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I remember, um, I won't, won't name and shame the particular <laughs> head of HR I was reporting to at the time, um, but I remember being in a dinner with this person uh, and very the person was trained as a lawyer and very proudly he looked at me and says, oh, Alexis is teaching me you can use data to find out the truth instead of just to back up your position. Mm -hmm. And I think it is a little bit unusual yeah. for us yeah. as practitioners and organizations to have such a grounding in that curiosity yeah. uh, as opposed to coming from a position of advocacy where what you're doing is cherry picking data to back you up. Yeah. And I think that that's really a superpower because cherry picking data to back you up will get you through an argument, but it won't get you to organizational success. It won't solve the problem. Whereas it won't solve the problem. It won't. It won't. It'll make you look good in that meeting. Like, let's be clear. It'll probably get you the promotion. I don't want to take away from that. But it is not durable. It's not sustainable. It's not equitable. It's not. Well, so the, the cool thing about that, one of the cool things I love about IO psychology is our end goal isn't to like make more money. I, we will help the company make more money. And that's like demonstrated that is true. But like, that's not our end goal. Our end goal is to make, as we're talking about, work better and for right. the humans. And I, I just I just love that. Um, okay. But a really cool thing about this live stream podcast is that we can get live questions from those who Okay. In. And so I thought this was a really interesting one. I'd love to hear your take on it. Uh, what are your thoughts on the role AI has on helping employees and organizations grow holistically? So I read a really piece, interesting piece of global research led out of Australia recently that looked at uh, employee perceptions or pub the public's perceptions of the use of AI in the workplace. And what was interesting is there was a very strong set of uh, favorable responses for things that helped you do your own work. So like drafting a proposal. Um, and I did this myself. I was like building an RFP f uh, as part of my PSYOP mm -hmm. thing recently. And so I told ChatGPT, like, here's what I'm working on. Give me uh, a RFP for this. And I asked it three times. It gave me different versions and I put them together. Like I just use it as a first draft. Yeah. But um, those kinds of things I think can really help employees and help them effectively. Uh, and then organizations, um, to the extent that they're aggregations of that, that really makes sense. One of the places that people people were more uncomfortable and you see legislation tackling is when the AI, instead of being used as sort of like starting point for a writing task mm -hmm. or a, a content generation task, is being used to make decisions. Mm -hmm. um, because if the training set is biased, mm -hmm then the outcome will be biased. And I tell people all the time, like I'm, I'm a, my like public persona is more like I'm a data science leader. And if you had just trained an AI based on existing data science leaders, I would never have been selected for one of these jobs because I'm a girl, I'm a blonde girl and I'm an older blonde girl, I'm over 50. Like I, I tick none of the correct boxes. And yet I do think I'm reasonably good at my job. And so you need to think about the training data sets. You need to think about um, how we're building all of this. Is it? Is it um, tuned to the task at hand uh, before you start letting these systems have a hand in a decision? So can it surface possibilities? Can it give you a first draft? Can it expand the, your capacity to, uh, to ingest and sort of sort things out? Yeah. Um, I think all of those are really helpful. Uh, and we've seen examples of that for quite a while. There's a lot of stuff we're calling AI that frankly, is regression. There's a lot of stuff we're calling AI that, frankly, is um, robotic process optimization. Mm -hmm. We're just doing the same thing faster, um, and we're doing it without human touch, um, but we're just repeating a process. Um, so, like, uh, automatic scheduling of interviews, the people will call it an AI, really not. Or query-based chat, we will call it an AI, it's re really not. Um, but there is a ton of potential for automation and it, there's a ton of potential to then take um, routine work and either make it faster or make it more efficient. Mm. And just like we saw um, in prior industrial revolutions, 
part of what that does is it frees up capacity to then do interesting, more uniquely human work. Yes. So, so it'll be interesting to see us get through this. Um, I remember, gosh, I, sh I should get the, I should get the reference. But decades ago, they were talking about by this time in history, we would all be working like 17 hours a week, which I know that's not my work week. Um, and somehow all the automation we've, we've built over the last several decades has not, in fact, resulted in a 17 hour work week for folks. We keep finding new ways to be smart uh, and new problems to tackle. So it'll be, it'll be interesting to watch. I'm optimistic that the busy, non-cerebral, non-creative work will be you know, more automated. And then exactly what you said, we can do more higher level, more creative, more strategic work. Um, at the end of the day, like you can't put strategy, you can't put creativity on these things and, you know, helping close gap, like a uh, shorten time to things that are menial now um, to open up more time for other things. And I'm seeing a lot of traction with the four day work week. I gotta say, I think that is like really, picking up and also the three, two or three days in the office. I feel like the buffering is getting us less hours. So I'm optimistic about that too. But Alexis, I could talk to you all day about all the topics. <laughs> I know you have to get back to work. I know uh, we got to start wrapping up the podcast. And so I have a big question and a small question I wanted to ask. Okay. Um, the small question is really easy, but if there was like one book or one website or one blog or one podcast that you'd recommend for IO psychologists to learn just a little bit more about anal like people analytics and the intersection of the two, like what would be a resource you'd recommend? I will give you one podcast and one book. Okay. Uh, the podcast is uh, um, uh, Directionally Correct. Mm which is typically an hour long interview about once a week with uh, generally a leading IO psychologist kind of person, but they're not exclusively IOs. And you'll often go quite deep into a particular technical area or their organization. So if you want to talk about people analytics specifically, that's a good one. Directionally, and then sorry, directionally sorry. correct. It's on okay. most of your streaming uh, platforms. And then there is the... Um, like the gateway drug to IO psychology or people analytics books, I think is Laszlo Bach's um, Work Rules, mm. uh, which is uh, really, it's like um, IO psychology dressed up in a more consumable package. Uh, and there's an awful lot of storytelling of how um, Google in particular used uh, data to solve people products. Or people problems, uh, and it's it's very um, easy to read. It doesn't read like a textbook. There is no math, um, but it gives a wide range of examples mm -hmm. of how you can use a people analytics framework in an organization. And it's an organization that people recognize and and generally has some cachet. Uh, yeah. It also cracks me up that on the book jacket, the last endorsement is from his five year old daughter. And says this is a boring book. So I appreciate the like humility that goes into that. Um, thank you for both those. I posted them. We'll have to put the links in the comments. Um, and then the second bigger question that I'd love to end with is where, what do you see as the future of IO psychology? So we did talk about, you talked about the potential yeah. of AI and like, what do you see as the potential and like where our field is going? Total world domination. Um, so it's really interesting to me, the number of CHROs that are mm -hmm. IO psychologists. Ooh, interesting. Lots and lots of those roles, much better than hiring a finance person to bring the qualitative stuff into, uh, into a, an HR type of a role. Um, mm -hmm. I'm really interested in seeing IOs honestly take their expertise into other parts of the business. We're seeing lots of IOs in marketing, lots of IOs in usability, um, user experience, um, lots of IOs going into different uh, adjacent fields, uh, product design or other kinds of things where you're taking this science really rooted in humans at this moment, we're in this inflection with AI, like what is it that people most need out of a system? Mm. Um, uh, if you, uh, the, the, the meta just launched yesterday, uh, a whole bunch of tuned AIs that really solve problems of human connection. And you need psychologists to help or people with a grounding in social science to help understand how that kind of stuff works. And I see a great role for IO psychologists playing in that. I also see a wonderful role for IO psychologists playing, increasing 
in um, the core of businesses. So when I went to graduate school in the 90s, you know, people were usually the closest they got to a head of HR was like four layers below when they're mm -hmm. really in um, uh, sort of buried somewhere or they were in external firms or the government. Mm -hmm. And now we're seeing so many um, organizations where their learning team is loaded with biopsychologists, you see executive coaches who are biopsychologists, you see people working on um, not just performance management and not just selection, but sort of all kinds of areas going deep in organization development and organization design and strategy. Uh, and so I see more and more of that. The training is so robust and so so appropriately tuned to meet the moment with the blend of the technical and the human and ethics um, that I'm just really, really excited uh, for what is ahead. Me as well. And one final yes, and getting more IO psychology into undergrad programs, like yes. the effort of whatever committee does this educational or the yes. getting yes. IO, training. Yeah, getting IO into textbooks. And yes in a more meaningful way that just not in the appendix, you know, like an actual right. chapter. And I love uh, D the D the DIP program. Is yes. it diversifying IO psychology? Is that what they I think so. Okay. Yes. Like hearing about what they do and like really targeting students at the undergrad level and yep. giving them mentors and then giving them research opportunities at the conference. It's just like, this is the work that needs to be done. We need to be intentionally like growing the field from the psychology departments at the university level and even the high school level. I knew I wanted to go into psychology as a high school student. And so like, right. yeah, I see and my high school psychology class never mentioned IO. No, I didn't know that in there at all. And, Afterwards. and if you want to be a psychologist and you like humans, but you also would like to have like a predictable paycheck and you want to deal with like the upside of things as opposed to solving problems and, 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 and spending a lot of your day dealing with tears, like I was the way to do it. it really um, is. And, and I, I, I tell people all the time, people spend more of their time at work than they spend doing anything other than sleeping. Right. Yeah. So if mm -hmm. I want to make humanity better, I need to tackle the place where they spend their time the thing that defines their ability to have, you know, a reasonable work life that um, defines their ability to support their family in many cases is very core to their feelings of self-efficacy, self-esteem, to their bodily health. Like that's where humanity spends its time and calories and energy. So let's tackle that. I can't think of a better way to sum up why IO psychology is so amazing and just today's episode. So thank you so much for joining us today, Alexis. This was so much fun and uh, I'm, I'm fired up. I feel like in the day to day, you kind of like sometimes lose sight, especially when you're like earlier career and like all bright eyed and bushy tailed, like I'm on a big IO kick today. Like this is awesome. I like it. Yeah. Yeah. Go our field. But to our podcast listeners, thank you for tuning in. Uh, for those live, thank you for joining us. Thanks for your questions and your activity in the chat. Uh, and Alexis, on behalf of myself and all of SIOP, thank you for such an engaging and enlightening conversation and just for taking the time to speak with us today. I am honored to have been invited. It was a really fun conversation. It's always nice to get to talk to you, Victoria. And uh, I'll see you in April. Yes, you certainly will. Uh, and then for those of y'all listening in, please join us for the next conversation on October 26th at 11.15 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, thanks again for joining us today. We look forward to talking to you soon. And until next time, take care.